Jimbo Paris, and you are listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. All right, how's it going, everyone? This is Jimbo Paris. Welcome again to the Jimbo Paris Show. Today we have Robin, and he is a keynote speaker, author, and he is an expert entrepreneur and coach. And from what I could see, he's very, very focused on startup master and kind of helping businesses to essentially make startups. So let's see what he has to say. Seems like an interesting guy. <laughs> How's it going, man? Very well, thank you. Very excited for the show this afternoon. Very excited. Oh, all right. What <laughs> accent is that? What accent? Uh, English. So I'm English. from the south southwest of the UK. Yep. Oh, wow, okay. All right. And I notice you're wearing the fearless shirt. What's the connotation to that? Uh, well, it was a bit of a happy accident, actually. I was I've been coaching for a couple of years and delivering a talk in a local networking event, business networking event, and. Uh, I, I think I said something along the lines of business owners need to just fear things in business ever so slightly less. Otherwise, they just get in the way and stop them from achieving their goals. And a, a very good friend of mine, bearing in mind there's sort of 80 odd people in this event, he stood up and he pointed at me and he said, fearless business, that should be the name of your brand, your coaching program. So that was about five years ago and it's it stuck ever since. So... Tell me something about yourself. Who is Robin? I'm a husband, father. I've got two girls. They're nine and six. So they definitely keep me on my toes. They're my best coach between the three of them. I'm a cyclist uh, so and a surfer. I have a Guinness World Record as well. So that's it in a nutshell. And then in terms of my day job, obviously, I run a, a coaching program, Fearless Business, as you know. I've worked with a broad range of sort of different businesses over the years, from sort of big multi-million pounds revenue uh, sort of law firms, right down to sort of grassroots businesses. And actually, the, the businesses I love, the people I love working with the, the, the most are those, you used the word right at the very beginning, startups, like small one-person businesses. They're like hero businesses. They're people who are doing it because they love the work which they do. They get amazing results for their clients. you know. And when you create a transformation in a business like that, you can actually see it happening and you can see the difference it makes to somebody's life. So yes, yeah, so that's me in a nutshell. Fascinating. And can we kind of get more into this idea of, that you mentioned, fearless hero businesses? What are you working on as a coach? How did this all begin? Yeah. So the reality is like when you're on the plains of Africa and, you know, there are genuine things to be afraid of. Right. So that, you know, there's hippos and crocodiles and lions and things like that. But the reality is that for many business owners, there's really nothing to be afraid of. You know that, well, there's two mm -hmm. things that could potentially go wrong in business. So it could be maybe you lose a little bit of money or you look a bit dumb. You look a bit stupid, essentially. And actually, the reality of those two things like they're not actually that bad like in the grand scheme of things you know people forget stuff and they move on so even if you do do something that is a little bit odd you know or stupid like you know give it a year and most people will have forgotten about it because they've got their own lives to get on with and you know the whole sort of goal around growing a business is it's the three f's the golden three f's so it's got to be fulfilling you've got to enjoy it it's got to give you the freedom which you want. And ultimately also, you know, the goal of a business is to make profit, is to make a bit of money. So finance, that's the third F. And, you know, there are so many business owners out there. If you watch Shark Tank or if you watch Dragon's Den here in the UK or any of those similar sorts of programs, you know, every single one of the business owners on there, the entrepreneurs on there who is, you know, being pitched at, they've all built businesses and they've lost everything they've rebuilt their businesses they've lost everything they've rebuilt everything they've lost it again you know mm. and they've been through that cycle several times so you know the second um sort of you know failure as it were if you lose a bit of money well there's plenty of case history out there to show that you can always make it back again and start up and start up a new business again and have the success that you want so the reality is like there's nothing to be fearful of there's nothing to fear in business and like business owners i find like they worry about such, you know, I, I suppose to the individual, uh, they are big things. They're, it's a big deal until you show them the reframe, you show them a different way of thinking about it. So simple things like standing up, for example, and doing a 60 second pitch in front of 50 other business owners at a networking event, like 90% of people, when they walk into that room the first time, they're absolutely petrified. The last thing they want to do is get up and speak. 
But once you've done it a few times, you know, the fear starts to subside a little bit and you've got to go through that process of like practice in order to get better at your craft, to get better at your pitch, to be able to better communicate what it is that you actually do as a business owner. What, another big fear is around pricing, for example, which is one of my sweet spots. You know, too many business owners undersell themselves because they're too afraid to ask for more money because they think like their big fear is rejection. They think that if they ask for more money, they're going to get rejected. But like, again, the goal isn't to go out and collect as many clients as you can, can. It's not to get loads and loads of yeses. It's to get a nice balance of yeses and a nice balance of noes. And I believe a good sort of conversion rate for a small business owner is somewhere around the order of 20 to 40%. So mm. actually you're getting a majority of no's. And if you were to call that failure in a way of getting lots of no's, well, you know, if you get too many clients and you're not charging enough, ultimately what happens is the business implodes on itself because most small businesses, they don't have systems and processes to deal with a large volume of clients. So the, the dream business is to have like half the clients, I get lots of no's, turn away more clients than you're taken on, but make double the income. Mm. That, that's an interesting uh, viewpoint. And do you think there's also a difference too in your market you work in? Because you tend to work with businesses more so in Europe versus America. You think there's carryover? Well, actually, funny enough, I've got clients. Um, I think we're in about 15 different countries now. So ranging from mm -hmm. Brazil, US, Canada, other side of the globe. And we've got clients in Shanghai and Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, and several European countries. So we've got kind of a very broad range. But I actually see that many of the challenges that business owners face across the world, they're, they're kind of the same. It's it, how much do I charge? How do I articulate the value of my offer? How do I actually go out and attract more clients? You know, whilst we may not want more clients, ultimately, most people believe that their biggest challenge is marketing, i.e. I need more clients, until you show them that you're, you need to reprice that offer and repackage it up. One thing which I have noticed, though, is that, you know, certainly the American Canadian sort of market, they do tend to kind of call a spade a spade. They're just like, this is what it is. They're very honest and they just kind of cut through all of that. I think European culture, I, I think we tend to kind of um, we don't want to kind of say no to stuff. We don't want to, you know, we'll avoid having that slightly difficult conversation, Jimbo, you know, rather mm. than actually just, you know, punch the issue in the face and just deal with it. Okay, quite interesting. And speaking of kind of these business influencers, what sort of led you to this career? What, in terms of like the, the freedom for August this year or just in general led me to where I am now? It's more of a generalized question because I tend to find entrepreneurs usually have, they, they have, they've done something before kind of getting into this whole thing about working with other businesses and building other startups. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I actually ran a marketing agency for 12 years before I set up Fearless Business. So I ran that. Well, there's a little bit of a backstory actually behind how even I ended up um, setting up that business. So when I was at sort of 18 to 22 years old, I studied at uni, I had a part time job. And then I got towards the end of it, I just got a bit disillusioned with the job and like the the, the, the guy who owned the business. So it was, it was in used to manufacture medical equipment. So it's quite sort of technical what we were doing and I, I used to build databases I'm a numbers geek basically I love love databases spreadsheets numbers and that sort of thing finances um very into that sort of stuff but I could see that the the owner of the business um we got the business to about 1.5 million pounds revenue so it's a good small business and the business owner was just brilliant at designing products but terrible at running a business I mean you'd think there'd be some money left out of a million and a half a year but no, he just, he managed to spend it all and put us into debt as well. And I had just had it, this nagging thing at the back of my mind. I think I could do it better. If I gave something a shot myself, I reckon I could do it better. <laughs> and so whilst I, I was actually on holiday in Florida, my girlfriend at the time, we went to a place called West Palm. And whilst I was out there, one of the people from the previous company said, oh, Rob, I know you're into this tech stuff. Listen, I'm thinking about setting up a web design business, a marketing business. Are you in? Do you want to join me? So that's what we did. We registered that business to get it funded. Uh, I used to buy and sell. They were called grade two listed laptops. I mean, bearing in mind, this is 20 years ago. This is like 2002, 2003 now. So the, these laptops, they were Toshiba laptops that you could twizzle the screen around and turn it into a tablet. So bear, like this is 20 years ago, right? These is like, you know, really high end stuff. And I used to sell them into construction companies, but I'd buy them for like 500 
dollars, five, you know, five, six hundred pounds. And then I would sell them to construction companies for about 10 times that four or five thousand pounds. Right. And I did this for about six months and made just silly money during that time and used that money then to start up the new business. Really exciting. And then I think what happened is a load of other people saw what I was doing because I was selling them all on eBay. So loads of people saw what I was doing and kind of copied it. And then the market just went flat and I was only making like, you know, one, 200 pounds profit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I know a bit about that because IBM, they used to have this thing called a ThinkPad and it was like the same system and it failed entirely as well. So I was I think that's interesting. So she yeah, did well, the, the Toshiba ones were brilliant. I mean, look, I could, I could geek out about this stuff because I still love those products because it did me so well for those that time. But um, they were modular. So if a disk drive failed, you'd take one out and plug another one in and it would work again. So it's like it was a really smart system. And Toshiba, literally the construction companies, you could put them in these tough cases, drop them off a 10 story building and they would bounce and still work. They were really good pieces of kit. So I think that's why they were so in demand. But yeah, and then transitioned into running the, the marketing agency. And we used to do just web design and branding, which again, back then was quite unique. There weren't that many people doing it. There was some really interesting stuff which happened in the 12 years I ran that. So for example, this is the power of what the internet has done like over the last 30 years since its inception. But when I first started my business in the UK, and I think these stats are relatively sort of replicated in the States and other countries as well. But in the UK, we had about 475,000 registered small businesses in the UK when I started that business. By the time I sold my agency, what, 12 years later, there were 6 million registered small businesses in the UK. So like tenfold increase in the number of registered businesses out there. So if you think about it, there's 10 times the number of web designers, 10 times the number of accountants, 10 times, the we name it, there was 10 times the number of every single sort of industry. And, and actually what happened was it got harder to run a business over that decade because there was so much competition and, and it just forced all of the prices down. Certainly here in the UK, it just forced all of the prices down and no, and it meant that nobody was really being that successful. There was a few sort of standout mm -hmm. businesses. We were very fortunate. The recession in 2008, 2009 did us a massive favor because a load of those businesses went out a bit. And this sounds like really harsh, right? But a load of those businesses failed. They went under because they just weren't profitable enough. And this is where like fearless like comes into its own, where you have to think differently to other businesses. You have to make different decisions to all the other businesses. Because if you just follow the herd, you're all doing the same thing. Nobody stands out. So when everybody was fighting over prices on things like, I mean, we were selling web hosting. So everybody was like race to the bottom, five pound a month, 10 pound a month for hosting, like peanuts. And I said to my business partner, we have to go the other way. We have to be like minimum, our base package needs to be like 10 times that, like 50 pound a month. It was that one decision which took us through that recession because we built up probably, again, it's not much money in the grand, grand scheme of things. Looking back then, it felt like a lot of money, but... We were doing probably 10 to 12,000 pounds a month on recurring revenue alone for a small agency with like three or four people in it, mm -hmm. you know, and then we had projects on top of that. And it literally, that saw us through the recession. And I remember in my local town, probably pre, pre recession, there were maybe 25 agencies post recession, there was five and we were one of them, you know, so going the, against the grain, doing the opposite of what everybody else is doing is sometimes hugely beneficial. Can we kind of go deeper into that business move that you made? So you raised the cost in general yeah. for... Oh. Yeah, so it, literally it, there's this thought process, right? That if you discount mm -hmm. something, if you reduce your prices, then it should make it more attractive. More people should want it and come and buy it because it's cheaper. But the difference is, so if, if you take, I don't know, let's say, you know, your supermarket, for example, where you buy your groceries, where like if somebody walks in there and they buy milk and bread, right? Just the daily sort of stuff. And they walk past the baked bean aisle and they see that baked beans are on like a two for one offer. They'll go, oh, I'll, I'll grab some beans. I like beans. There's a two for one offer. The reason it works for grocery stores to do discounts and sell things cheaper is because they have something called latent demand. A load of people walking through their store every day getting bread and milk. Most small business owners, though, on the other hand, they don't have that latent demand. They're trying to stimulate and create demand. So they can't just throw an offer out there and all of a sudden loads of people buy it because they just they just don't have the people walking through their store. 
So discounting doesn't attract people. And, and, and like when you put your prices down or even like now where you've got, it's, it's turning into a bit of an economics lesson. I hope I'm not going to lose too many people here. But wh where you've got inflation going up this year, you know, by 10% or more over the last 12 months, if you keep your prices the same, you're actually 10% worse off than you were this time last year because of inflation, right? So that in effect is a 10% discount that you've kind of introduced. And again, mm -hmm. like people think they do it to, to be competitive, but what happens is when you drop your prices, you're signaling to the market, I've got a ton of baked beans. Now, I don't know about you, but if all of a sudden, like, what, what's your favorite type of car? Like as a kid, what car did you look at? And you're like, that's my dream car. I'd love to have that. Mm, I would say maybe Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce. So what's a Rolls Royce cost these days? So if you went for a Phantom, it's like, what, three, four hundred thousand dollars? Four hundred thousand. Four hundred thousand dollars, right. Imagine if Rolls Royce all of a sudden they're like, oh, we're not selling many Phantoms at the moment. I tell you what we'll do. We'll drop the price to like 40K or 100K even. You'd be like, why are they dropping the price of it? Why were they selling it for 400,000 last week? And now all of a sudden it's 100,000. Like, are they ripping me off with the, so all of a sudden you see all this dynamic of like psychology starting to creep in here. And now is that phantom more or less desirable? Well, yeah, it becomes less desirable. It becomes less desirable. Now all of your mates have got Rolls Royce phantoms, right? And you're thinking, well, I never I thought of it like that. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, so you drop the price and now, and you signal to the market, we've got a whole load of these things. It makes it less attractive, not more attractive. Okay. And sort of when you began to take this risk and kind of make this massive change of raising, you know, your prices for web hosting, like, how did you spend your days? I was very hands-on personally. I was doing a lot of the sort of sales, marketing, project management and that side of it. We took on a lot of apprentices as well. That was our sort of, one of our ways of giving back to the community was we used to take on sort of seven green 17 or 18 year old people, train them up to be coders, web designers, and took, took a huge amount of sort of enjoyment out of sort of training them up. So that was like how I spent most of my days. But generally we were, we were building websites. We, we created this this was really fun. We created these branding workshops. They were like a one day branding workshop. So I don't know if you know much about sort of traditional like graphic design and freelance work it tends to be quite long and convoluted, a bit of a negotiation. And then there's quite often a lot of stress in the process because like what you have in your mind, this idea about this logo that you want to get is never quite cre recreated as you thought it might be by the designer, right? We used to have this really long protracted logo design process and it was quite frustrating for us, definitely frustrating for the client. And one day I thought, there has to be a better way. And this is just, again, the way I have the analytical, the numbers, that side of the logical side of my brain came out. And I was just like, what if we could do logo design in a day? What if we could, somebody needed a logo next week, we could get them into our office, we'd go through this seven step process and we'd design them a logo. We managed to achieve it. The first one we did, I think the client came in at like eight o'clock in the morning and they left at about half past nine at night. So it was like a full day's worth of grind. But we got the job done. They got their logo. They loved it. They got a style guide so they knew how to use it and things like that. And gradually we refined this process down to being probably about five hours. So we client would come in sort of half nine, ten. It'd be fairly leisurely. We'd split it up the day up with the lunch. They'd be gone by about three or four. It was brilliant. Again, this was another real great lesson that I learned from a pricing perspective. So where I already had that, well, instead of going down on price, we've seen it work with the hosting. So we've seen it go up. So with the logo design process, which is typically most people charge out like an hourly rate. So they'll charge like 50 bucks an hour, 80 bucks an hour or something like that for as like a freelance graphic designer. And we were doing the same. So we discovered that even over the course of like a three month graphic design, like logo design process, we may only build 10 hours. So we were building like a few hundred pounds for this long drawn out process. But when it came to the one day thing, I remember the first time I pitched it still like vividly, the guy said, I've got a product launch coming up like next Thursday, I need a logo for it. And nobody else can do it for me. Like, what could you do? And I said, well, I've got this idea for this one day branding workshop. Would you be up for like being a guinea pig for it? And he said, yeah, definitely. It sounds perfect. It's exactly what I want. How much does it cost? And I just made a number up. Like, I was like, well, normally, like, in a day, like, 50 pounds an hour, it's like, 500 pounds. Like, if we're, if, we're, if we're solving a big problem for him, i.e. needs this fast, and he needs it done to a high quality, well, surely it's worth a lot more than 500 pounds. So I just went 1,500 quid. And I kid you not, there and then, he transferred the money. 
we booked the date in, I booked the graphic designer and we delivered the workshop, you know, a couple of days later. And a few months after that, so we'd now delivered 20 or 30 of these things and we're starting to get well known for it. One of my mentors phoned me up and he was like, Robin, and I don't know if you're familiar with the geography of the UK. So it's, it's obviously, you know, it's probably about the size of one of your states in the US, right? But for us Brits, it's like, it's a long way to get from the top to the bottom of it and vice versa. Okay. So my mentor, he said, uh, and I'm based down in sort of the bottom half of it. My mentor said, Robin, I've booked you for one of your branding workshops tomorrow. It's up in York, which is at the top end of the country, miles away. How much is it going to cost? And I said, I don't want to go to York tomorrow. It's just too far. I've got family and this, that, and the other. It's like, just don't want to do it. And um, he said, give me five minutes. And he hung up. And then literally five minutes later, the phone goes and um, he says, Robin, would you drive to York tomorrow? So you'll have to come up tonight. We'll book your hotel, deliver the workshop. But would you do it for 18,000? And my eyes literally popped out of my head. I was 18 grand. He's like, yeah, clients agreed to 18,000. Would you do it? I was like, yeah, sign me up. I'm, I was in my car, gone all the way up to York. But again, like you think about the progression of like 500 pounds to 1500 to then 18,000. And somebody was willing to pay for that. You know, probably if I hadn't been pushed a little bit by my mentor, then I wouldn't would never have asked for that much. So the next question is, um, what personal habit are you proudest of? Gosh, that's a really good question. So I'm very sort of dedicated, like family guy. So things like the morning routine with me, with the girls is massively important. Even when they don't want hugs and kisses and try and push me away, they still get them right love showing love is actually like a really massively important part of my life especially where my children are concerned and then business wise it's for me it's about it's too easy like being running a business can be incredibly addictive right and this is goes back to what i was saying about the gary v hustle and grind thing actually creating space in the day in amongst like the sprints which you do so coaching for example is quite energetic it's quite an energetic exchange if I did back-to-back -back coaching sessions all day, I'd be ruined, like, you know, with like eight hours worth of coaching. So, for example, having the discipline to only book one or two coaching sessions absolutely max in a single day and make sure there's a nice gap in between. One, it serves me because I make sure I get a bit of downtime, a rest, a breather. I get to decompress. But also it serves the clients really well. You know, the few clients that I take on, it serves them really well because I then show up energized, ready to give the best that I possibly can do. It would be really easy for me to take on loads and loads of clients and probably make more money than I'm currently making. But for me, it's about there's a good balance between giving really high quality coaching and having a good, you know, again, matching up with the three Fs, freedom, finance, fulfillment. Now, while doing all this and kind of developing yourself, What's the most interesting thing that you've learned recently? One of the most interesting things is, that I've learned recently is about fearless dynamics. It's the dynamic energy that a business experiences. And I think life goes this way as well sometimes. But most people expect, well, business is a good example. So we expect business to be like that growth, just steady growth upwards, no kind of peaks or troughs, just go like that. Most people know that the business life cycle kind of looks like that. But you can actually break the, that business, that craziness, you know, going up and down the dilly dumps of business and life down into essentially kind of four very clearly defined stages. So the first one is kind of just, you know, you might have a little bit of an upturn, but the longer sustained period of growth tends to be more of a consolidation phase, it tends to be a flat line. And that's when you know you're kind of doing things right. It's kind of okay. It's quite calming. It's quite relaxing in the first instance. But... If it goes on for too long, you then start to move into stage number two, which is where you start to question yourself. Well, why aren't I experiencing growth? Why? And, and you start to fear like, well, shouldn't we be getting more clients or shouldn't I be having more joy in my life or more happiness or however you want to sort of rationalize it, whatever. So that you end up in this kind of period of like a bit of self-doubt starts to creep in. You're a bit of uncertainty and bit, the fear starts to creep in. Well, what's going to happen next? And it could go one or two ways. It could, it could carry on, for, well, actually three ways. It could carry on a little bit longer. It could go up, it could go down. But inevitably what tends to happen is it goes down. Because what we try and do, and this is the third phase, we try and force the issue. We try and break stuff to fix it, to make it better, right? 
It's a natural part of the learning process. Progress isn't about things just getting better. It's like, you know, Thomas Edison and his 10,000 experiments. That guy had to fail 9,999 times before he got that one experiment, you know, and created the incandescent light bulb. It's, it's that typical sort of thing. So things start to go wrong. They break. We fail. The, the key thing is we learn from that which then leads us through to the breakthrough phase, step number four, whoosh. So where we consolidated here, breakthrough takes us up to level two. And then guess what? We consolidate. <laughs> we move into self-doubt. We dip. We have create those failures. Things break. And then we have another breakthrough. And I think when people accept that is just a part of life, and especially business as well, then, you know, you can see that success happens in stages. It's downturn followed by big upturn, downturn followed by big upturn. And we step up, we step up, we step up. And you have two best-selling books, correct? Yeah. Um, I think the first one, the biggest one is like online business startup. And then the second one is take your shot. That's right. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit of the story behind those two books? Yes. So online business startup I wrote in 2013, and that was kind of coming to the end of my agency days. And I realized that, you know, all of the most attractive people business wise were, they had books out basically. So I was quite fortunate. I did a business accelerator program and that's where I met my mentor and various other amazing contacts along the way. But online business startup was an interesting one because we had somebody spend a day with us teaching us all about publishing. And I got really into it. I was like, yeah, I'm going to write a book. And I remember I asked a question because originally it was going to be like, it was going to be called Why Websites Fail. It was going to be a book about like how to make a better website success, more successful, get more visitors, get more clients and that sort of thing. But I had deep down and I didn't realize at the time I had this like really burning like desire to talk to people about business strategy. Um, and I put my hand up tentatively at the back of the room and I said, um, I th I, is it OK if I'm going to write a book about websites, but I want to talk a little bit about website strategy. Is it OK if I write a chapter um, and the guy, there was a guy stood behind me, a guy called Daniel Priestley, who's an um, influential author. He's got four best-selling books himself and taught me a lot of what I know now. He just shouted out, Rob, just write 10 chapters. It shouldn't just be like, you know, if it, if it goes well, just write another bloody book on it. You know, he's like quite vociferous. He was just like, just write it. So it ended up being the online part. So how to get your business set up online. Um, the business part, so what what were my 10 lessons in business that I wish I'd known 10 years previous to that? And then the startup part. So that's just helping people to then launch their business out there into the ether. Um, and that did well. It, it, I think it sold 15, 20,000 copies. It wasn't just one of these fly-by-night sort of Amazon bestsellers for like an hour. It, it ended up being, I think, in the small business and entrepreneurship category for something like three and a half years at number one here in the UK and various other countries as well. So great accolade. Take your shot, though, the other one. I've got so that one um, was slightly different, actually. So when I sold my agency and people started asking me about, oh, I saw you sold your agency. How did you do that? Could you teach me? I realized that kind of online business startup, it, it didn't really match up with the kind of business coaching, mentoring sort of like brand philosophy. Story. It, it wasn't quite aligned with what I was helping people with. And the, the book itself was... I was going to offer this as a gift to your to anybody um, listening as well, because I've got some signed copies just as a little bit of a present for everybody who's taken the time to watch this. So I, I'll try not to give too much away for those who are going to read it. But I did a, a webinar and it was a I was originally just going to work with like marketing agencies, web designers, those sorts of th people. I did a webinar, I had about 40 or 50 people on it. And it, afterwards, about five minutes later, my phone's ringing. And I'm like, it's, it was this, oh, oh, right, okay, you saw the webinar, great, okay, what it's, okay, cool, tell me about your business, like, and it was for, I thought I had 40 web designers in there, and the, the guy on the phone was a guy called Russ, who was a golf pro, <laughs> I was like, how on earth did you get onto my webinar for web designers, he said, oh, my mate's a web designer, he suggested I come and listen to you, because you're quite interesting, anyway, I, um, Russ, the golf pro, ended up becoming my first proper official coaching client, and so Take Your Shot is a story, effectively, about his his and my journey but it's told as a, a story like a parable um with five of like my core coaching sort of principles now from fearless business um we went through his pricing his offer uh got into a point where he was speaking and delivering like golf retreats and things like that which is like where his goals were he was like desperate just to do more than just be a local golf pro you know he's gone on to sort of do great things so yeah it's all all wrapped up in in there 
And sort of as a finalizing question, you know, uh, I have two more. And I think the first one is going to be, what advice could you give to anyone that's sort of planning to start a business? Give it a go. Just give take your shot, basically. If that's not too cheesy as a cliche, because that's the name of my book, but just... I've seen so many business, well, wannabe business owners just turn themselves inside and out with an idea and never put it into practice. And 10 years later, you're still talking about having the same conversation. Oh, I'd love to start a business. You're like, well, why haven't you? So my best advice is just give it a shot. Like, what's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work out. You go back and get a job. Like, there's no shame in that at all. I would always rather just know that I'd had a go and it, whether it worked out or not, if I hadn't had a go, I'd, it, would, it would kill me. Um, not not to know the outcome of it and alongside that as well like these days when people start businesses they get really hung up on things like branding websites social media uh, all of these different things um, the best thing you can possibly do as a new startup business owner is sell something and it doesn't matter whether it's for five bucks 500 bucks or five million bucks it, it really doesn't matter just get out there and sell something because I mean, I did a um, business management degree. I spent four years studying business. What I've put into practice out of those four years is probably 5% of what I learned. Like the other 95% of what I do day to day, I've had to learn on the job. And that just comes from selling something and failing and making mistake after mistake after mistake. And through that, you learn then what works and where your worth is. And. Final one, again, uh, how can people reach out to you? Yeah, so I'm, I mentioned um, earlier on, so I've got some signed copies um, of this book. Uh, so first of all, I'll mention that address if that's okay. So it's fearless.biz forward slash TYS. And I will ship them anywhere in the world except for, unfortunately, South Africa. Everything I've ever sent to South Africa has either got stolen or returned to me. So Sorry if anybody's listening from South Africa. Everywhere else, you're fine. We'll ship it all around the world. Um, so I'll sign it take it to the post office myself and ship it to you. Um, but yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. If you've got any questions, if anything's piqued your interest, if you just want to have a conversation about business, an idea you've got, a problem or challenge that you've got, um, and my website, which you can see up there as well, robinwaite.com, uh, just go and, go and shoot me a message. You know, I, I'll, I'll always, always take questions anytime. All right, excellent. Thank you for being on the show, Mr. Wade. It really was a privilege for both me and the audience. And, Likewise. Uh, appreciate it. So uh, we're just going to end it off here. Just a few quick shout outs. So the first one is going to be LifeWork Systems. This is our affiliate partner. If you want any ways of figuring out how to improve your business infrastructure, your employee infrastructure, and you have 100 plus or more people working in your business, reach out and I could give you a free connection to her and we could get started figuring that out for you. Next thing, it's going to be our YouTube channel. Subscribe now to us, ring that bell. Next thing is going to be our Roku channel. We're on Roku TV. That's also going to be uploaded there soon, but I'll let you know. And then the final thing is going to be Jimbo Paris Consulting Services. If you want anyone to help you out, start out your own podcast, learn and figure out how to create your own online business at cheap prices for free. Obviously, I'm offering you this for free. Ask me. And again, I could show you how to run a business using very, very low costs without depending on any type of other business to keep you up and running. And finally, we have a Kofi. Please uh, support me on Kofi. This business is entirely crowdfunded, so give me a quick donation, subscribe. Anything helps to just keep this up and run. All right. So thank you again for watching the show. This is the Jimbo Paris Show. Thank you for listening to The Jimbo Parish Show. 